Hello, everyone, and welcome to Tracking National Progress 2019 Europe Sustainable Development Report, hosted by the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, or SDSN for short, and the Institute for European Environmental Policy, or IEEP, who are the co-authors of this report. Um, my name is Cheyenne Maddox, and I am the Outreach and Events Manager at SDSN, and I am delighted to be your moderator for today. Uh, for a little bit of background, the Europe Sustainable Development Report was launched in November 2019 and is the first independent quantitative report on the progress of the European Union and its member states towards the Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs. Um, this webinar will give us an opportunity to learn more about the report, which includes the European SDG Index and Dashboards, uh, which is a tool that ranks countries on their progress towards achieving the SDGs. We will also discuss the impacts that COVID-19 and the SDGs have on one another, and we will hear how to mainstream the SDGs in EU policy processes in a post-COVID-19 world. Before we get started, I want to go over a few housekeeping items. To increase sound quality, no one of our participants today will be able to unmute their microphones. However, we very much encourage you to actively participate in the webinar and ask your questions in the chat box that you see to the right in your GoToWebinar control panel. We will be collecting your questions for two Q&A sessions throughout the webinar, so please send them as they come to mind. You will also find a few handouts in your control panel that include the report, a few other relevant, relevant documents, and a troubleshooting document should you be experiencing any audio issues. And my colleagues and I remain available throughout the entirety of the webinar to answer any questions you may have regarding the functionalities of the software. So feel free to drop us a line anytime. Um, so before I pass it over to our first speaker, we want to get an idea of where everyone is from. So I'm going to issue a quick poll and you should see this pop up on your screen. And we're going to give you about 30 seconds to select your answer. Everyone's very attentive this morning. Great job. <laughs> or this afternoon, I guess, in Europe. All right, going to give you about five more seconds. All right. Let's see. As expected, the majority of our attendees today are from Europe, um, but it's nice to see we have some representation from other parts of the globe. It might be a bit too late in the day for Australia. <laughs> All right, gonna hide those results. All right, now that we have a better idea of where everyone is from, I'd like to pass it over to my colleague Guillaume Lafortune, who is uh, the SDG Index Manager at SDSN. Guillaume, if you want to turn your camera and microphone on. All right, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jayen. And good morning, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Guillaume Lafortune. I, uh, I, I manage uh, the production of the Sustainable Development Report within the SDSN. Uh, I'm an economist by training, and I will uh, present today um, the results of the 2019 edition of the European um, Sustainable Development Report, uh, but also share some uh, early thoughts uh, on COVID-19 and the SDGs. So I will share now my screen and my um, slides. So in theory, you should all be able to see my screen and, and my slides. Um, Cheyenne, can you confirm? Yes, it looks great. Fantastic. Um, so um, just a quick word about the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. This is a global network uh, launched in 2012. We operate under the auspices of the UN Secretary General. Um, and we have three main priorities. We are uh, a think tank, so we have research capacity and we pro pro provide SDG policy analysis and support. We're a global network of knowledge institutions with more than 1,000 to 200 members. And we're also a training center. So we have an online um, education program called the SDG um, Academy. And so today I'll, uh, I'll, 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 I'll start um, with um, sharing some some thoughts on the COVID-19 and, and SDGs. These are uh, a very few um, early thoughts on the, the situation. I have to say that these webinars were scheduled actually before um, the, the, the COVID-19 outbreak. This was a long-term um, set of webinars we wanted to organize on our sustainable development reports. 
originally the idea was to focus only on the 2019 results but also to to share early thoughts for the 2020 edition of this report which will come out in november uh but since we now we are now in the midst of the of a, of a global um health crisis um i i, I added this first um, section related to covid 19 um and the and the sdgs um, my colleagues from the IEP in the second phase will share um, more specific thoughts related to policies and regulations um, in the, for the EU context. Um, but before I start, I wanted also to, uh, to do a little um, poll to just get a, a feel about the level of optimism in the room or in these uh, webinars uh, related to the impact that people anticipate that COVID-19 will have on the achievement of the SDGs by 2030. So as for the first poll, um, I will um, give you the opportunity to respond. There's four answer options and I'll give you 30 seconds um, to answer this, uh, this poll. Okay, I will give you five more seconds. Three, two, one, zero. So we have uh, about 16% of people that believe it's uh, too early to tell or have no opinion on the question, which was, uh, in your view, will the impact of COVID, uh, what will be the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on the achievement of the SDGs? About 34 percent say that it will slow down so very negative 38 think it will have mixed impacts and 12 percent believe that it will accelerate progress on the sdg so this question we actually asked it um to uh to the sdg community so we polled and we got responses from about a thousand people and i am uh i am glad to see that um uh, this uh this room is a little bit more optimistic than what the SDG community shared with us. So the results of the, the thousand people survey that we did shows that there's um, a, a little bit less of people that said that it will accelerate the implementation of the goals, about 10%. And a few more people say that it will be only negative, uh, about um, 36%. Uh, so um, I'll move back to the presentation. Um, and, and actually, I'll, I'll, I'll show you the slide. So this is the, the, the results of our preliminary results of our polls. So you see here we have about 10.2% that say that it will be very positive and 36 that say that it will be um, really negative. Um, so we have an optimistic, a slightly more optimistic group here uh, today. Um, so on COVID-19 first. Um, I think here, I mean, this is something that we get asked a lot these days is you know, what will be the impact of COVID-19 on the sustainable development goals? And I think it's very, it's very difficult to say at, at the moment and to quote the chief economist of the IMF when she gave the, the results of the April World Economic Outlook, um, uncertainty is clouding all um, the forecasts. So I think there's still a lot of things we don't know um, right now. On the epidemiological side, the season, seasonality of the virus is unclear. The risk of a second, uh, even third wave uh, will depend also on the success of the deconfinement measures. The timeline for treatment and vaccine remains quite um, uh, uncertain still. We still don't know how badly will African countries and Latin American countries be impacted. And there's obviously lots of questions and doubts around the accuracy of the data and the, and the statistics at the moment. Um, on the economic style, side, you know, the feeling is that we're heading towards a long tail economic recovery. Um, so it will, it will not be a, a quick uh, V-shaped recovery. Uh, the big question is how quickly will domestic uh, and international demand pick up? Um, I think this, this is a very big question, uh, question mark. Uh, you know, as we are starting to deconfine, um, stores and, and, and shops and factories might, uh, might restart, but uh, we don't know if uh, domestic demand will be there uh, and international demand might be disrupted for quite a long while um, due to disruption in the in the international supply chains. And then the economic stimulus, uh, you know, what will be the impact on microeconomic stability and uh, infl inf inflation? These are also major questions. So on global output, I think a lot of you in the room have seen the um, the uh, 
the predictions of the of the IMF for the for 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 the world. So minus three percent. Uh, in real GDP growth for 2020, they expect recovery in 2021, and this is much worse, at least for 2020, for the euro area compared to, to, to other regions. The IMF expects recovery by 2021, uh, but again, uh, the chief economist said that uncertainty is really clouding the, 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 the forecast. So predicting the impact of global output is, is, a cha is, is challenging in itself. Predicting the impact on the SDGs <laughs> is probably uh, even more of a challenge. So, what we've seen is a set of um, qualitative assessments uh, that have been done. Uh, I think an example at the global level is what uh, UN DESA uh, has released um, earlier this month, which is basically doing a mapping of um, the, the impact that COVID-19 will likely have on um, the SDGs, including on gender equality, income inequalities, uh, poverty, but also on some of the environmental and, um, and, and biodiversity goals. Um, on our side in SDSN, we haven't released for now a thought piece um, on the issue. We will do so in our next um, global SDG index and dashboards, which will come out uh, around mid-June um, this year. So we are working on a, on a thought piece uh, on COVID-19 and the SDGs under the, the leadership of the American economist Jeffrey Sachs. What we have done is to poll um, the SDG community on the issue. This was one question that was asked to the community. There were a few other questions related to uh, which areas of the SDGs will be uh, most impacted and how can the SDGs be um, a, a useful uh, framework to inform um, the recovery um, and, and investment plans um, after the, the health and economic crisis. Um, and then a, a point here, um, because this, this presentation here is about the SDG index and dashboards and the measures that we have to track implementation of the SDGs, um, something that comes back um, to us quite a bit is um, do you have, whether we cover the issue of countries' um, health preparedness on, um, for global health security, um, or whether we plan to integrate measures of countries' preparedness to face epidemics in our next um, in our next reports. And so here, what this this graph shows and the analysis that we released, uh, my colleague Finn and I um, last week, is to compare a measure that was launched in November 2019 called the Global Health Security Index with um, some of the, the the data that we have uh, on COVID uh, on COVID-19. Um, so we included a, an index, which is a COVID-19 uh, safety index. Uh, and we also um, compared the results of the November, so pre-COVID index to uh, mortality rates, incidence rates, but also to testing. And so the overall GHS um, showed that the US uh, and the UK were the best prepared in theory to face a, a, an epidemics. Um, and including on several of the, so overall in the ranking, but also on several of the pillars. And here what you, what this graph shows here is that on the left, um, on the top left side, you have the ranking for the specific pillar related to detection and reporting. So you see that the US was ranked number one, South Korea number five, and Germany number 10. When we compare those pre-COVID results, to actually the amount of tests per capita that were performed um, during COVID, so from March 1st to, to April 12th, actually the ranking would be the opposite. So Germany per capita tested, tested much more of its population uh, than the US and South Korea also tested much more. And what's interesting is to look at the gap um, in, in, in March. So the, the US gap in COVID-19 tests performed in March where we see that it turned out that the US was much slower to start testing a, a large share of its population. And so this just illustrates the potential limits in the measures that are currently available to track countries' uh, preparedness, which would be covered possibly by SDG 3.D um, uh, on the capacity and resilience of our systems. Um, and so this is still, we're still you know, looking and analyzing the existing measures. Uh, but our, our feeling is that in light of COVID, uh, in light of COVID-19, we might need to rethink a little bit about what are the best measures and indicators to track um, countries' preparedness at the, at the global level. So this, uh, I put the link here, the analysis is, is available on our, on our website. Moving on to the SDR 2019. Um, so obviously the results are all uh, pre-COVID and I'll share also a few thoughts on our, on our next edition as a, as a last slide. So 
this European Sustainable Development Report is part of a broader set of report that we are doing in the, in the SDSN related to monitoring the sustainable development goals. So we have global editions, but then we wanted to contextualize also a little bit more um, the, the monitoring of the SDGs, but also the, the narrative sections of the report to specific regions. So we've done reports for Africa, for um, the European Union. We also have a report for um, the Arab state region, and we're um, going to launch very soon in addition for Latin America as well, obviously leveraging data from the region. So in the, in the European edition, we relied extensively um, on data from the European Commission, including Eurostat, at the European Environmental Agency and all the fantastic work done by the European Commission, also by the, the Joint Research Center um, as well, which we obviously cannot do for, for global editions. This European edition was a collaboration between the IEEP, uh, the Institute for European Environmental Policy, the SDSN, and we worked also with the European Economic and Social Committee, and this was supported by the Finnish Presidency and the Heinrich Boll uh, Foundation. Um, so continental edition, we also do subnational editions because obviously cities uh, and, and municipalities are key for the implementation of the SDGs. Having one data point per country doesn't show the territorial inequalities within countries. So we also released many reports in collaboration, obviously, with our with our networks um, for the US, for Spain. I think some of the authors of the Italian City Index are in this webinar. And we've also done editions for European cities and, uh, and we're preparing other editions for countries in Latin America. So for this European index, we, uh, we, we looked at, uh, at uh, so we, we, we published a, it's my slide. Uh, so we published a overall, um, an overall uh, ranking, which um, using a set of a bit more than a hundred indicators, which were discussed and where we consulted extensively on uh, and so we have a methodology um, to generate these results, which was audited by the European Commission Joint Research Center. And the methodology was also published in the Nature, um, in the, the peer-reviewed uh, journal um, Nature. So in our, um, in our 2019 uh, SDG index, Denmark, um, Sweden, and, and Finland topped, uh, topped the, 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 the ranking. Uh, and the European Union average was equal to 70%, which means that the European Union is 70% uh, on the way to achieving the, the SDGs. But more importantly, I mean, this size, the overall ranking, which is obviously a lot really, uh, which is a lot for, for communication purposes, we, we also um, published a dashboards, which really showed where we saw the main issues. And so here, the goals that, that came up, um, uh, you know, as major challenges for Europe are SDG2, uh, especially related to sustainable agriculture um, and, uh, and, and diets, uh, including obesity. Then intra and inter um, inequalities, so inequalities within, uh, within member states, um, so under SDG 10, but also um, the convergence uh, process, which is covered under SDG 9, Industry, Innovation and Infrastructure, which is the goal where we saw the biggest spread in performance across member states. So very good performance from some member state and very poor performance from, uh, from others. And then finally, um, SDG 12 to 15 related to um, the climate and uh, biodiversity crisis. Here, the performance is relatively poor, essentially across, um, across, across the board. We also present indication of trends um, in the report. What we have done for this report is also to show um, a, uh, a leave no one behind um, index. Um, so this is taking only the measures which track um, inequalities within countries. So poverty and material deprivation, income inequalities, access to inequality of services, but also gender inequalities. And so what we looked at, for instance, on an indicator like life expectancy, um, we use life expectancy for the SDG index, but then we also use a measure of gap, for instance, by, um, by income um, or gaps between rural versus urban. And so those gap measures, we put them into a, a single measure and we looked um, how equal uh, are um, societies within, within, within Europe. So you can have a, rel a relatively good SDG index performance, but have specific issues related to, to inequality. So this is what this Leave No One Behind index does. Um, we also showed in the report some of the trends by uh, European um, uh, subregions, so between Baltic states, Central and Eastern Europe, Northern Europe, Southern Europe, and Western Europe, uh, where we where we see, for instance, that when it comes to the Palmer ratio, which is a measure of um, income inequalities, um, not all um, the subregions of Europe of Europe are making progress towards achieving a Palmer ratio of one, which is 
the objective or a target that the American economist Tim Glitz um, said would be would be a relevant target for for countries to have. Um, on negative international spillovers, so these are impacts generated by European countries um, to the rest of the world. Um, so this is an aspect that we do cover in every report in SDSN. So not only do we track the domestic implementation of the SDGs, but also um, transboundary um, impacts um, using you know, different, different techniques. Um, and here we see that this is an issue for most um, EU member states. And so here we disaggregated the types of spillovers in four categories, those related to economics and financial. So things related like tax havens, financial secrecy, profit shifting, using data uh, for, from, uh, from Oxfam, for instance, or the Tax Justice Network. We also look at social spillovers, so how much, um, how many uh, fatal accidents at work can, can be attributed to European countries by importing from, from countries with poor labor standards. We also cover environmental spillovers generated through trade and um, consumption, as well as security types of spillovers, um, for instance, the trade in major conventional weapons. And so we took all these measures and we aggregated also a, a score for Europe here. And what we see is that if we compare to the Leave No One Behind Index, this one, the, the average for European Union is, is, is lower on this one, and we see a um, very significant issue on this, on this aspect. Um, related to those spillover uh, measures, uh, we have also um, released a platform which allows users to map uh, how uh, where are countries generating these negative impacts? So these are mainly focused on indicators for environmental types of uh, spillovers derived from what we call multi-regional input-output um, tables, which allow you to see through trade and consumption how much, for instance, in this example, Finland is impacting greenhouse gas emissions in other countries through, um, through trade. Um, and this is um, this is connected to what uh, Greta Thunberg calls the um, the creative carbon accounting. Um, so taking only account, you know, the, the, into account the production side and leaving aside um, impacts generated through consumption. So we have an integrated consumption-based accounting within our reports, and so we also track how much countries are um, generating impacts abroad, uh, because obviously in their efforts to to decarbonize. Um, domestically, countries should not outsource key sectors like cement and steel to other countries and then re-import the, the production. The SDGs being a global responsibility, um, this is no um, longer tolerable. And so we're able now to put numbers at the country level around this. Um, we present very detailed results, um, including where we see a missing data gaps. So this is the country profile for European Union. Everything is accessible online. Um, and then our next um, ESDR edition. So we are partnering with the, essentially the same organization, so with the IEP, um, and we will work closely with the with European Commission services. We plan to release the report in November 2020. The narrative sections of the report will obviously focus on COVID-19, the SDGs, and the EU's um, recovery. Unfortunately, due to the time lags in data reporting, um, it is unlikely that we will be able in the quantitative sections to reflect the impact of, uh, of COVID-19, but we will have a thought piece um, in the narrative um, sections. It will be co-designed co with civil society, so we're planning to make extensive consultation between June and October um, and, and workshops as well um, to, to, to mobilize uh, civil society around this. Um, the consortium, again, will be led by, by, by the IEP. We will work again with the European Economic and Social Committee. And if, uh, if you are interested and if this is something of interest, please um, reach out to us and we'll be very happy to... Uh, to, uh, to uh, to, to share with you some of the, the, the requests for, for, for consultations and engagement uh, processes and events that, that, that will be happening. Um, I will stop here uh, and I will let uh, my colleague Finn Wong, who is an analyst in the SDG Index team, walk you through um, the data visualization tool um, that we have developed uh, based on the European Sustainable Development Report. Finn, over to you. Hi, Finn. I think you need to unmute first. Thanks, Shayan. Um, hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be in this webinar. Uh, my name is Finn Bohm, and I work together with Guillaume at the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. My specialties are data analysis and data visualization, and I'm going to show you today the data tool that we built for the European Sustainable Development Report and walk you through some of the features uh, to help you get the most out of it. So let me start by sharing my screen. 
Shayan, uh, can you see a blank screen? Yes, I can. Perfect. All right, so the first step to using our data tool is to actually find it. Um, I saw that um, we already shared the link directly in the chat, so you should be able to see it there. But another way to find it is to actually go to our website, sdgindex.org. And here you will be able to see all of our reports. And if you scroll down just a little bit, you will find the 2019 Europe Sustainable Development Report. And under exported data, you'll be able to access it. There are a lot of different aspects to our data tool, um, such as country rankings, key messages from the report, um, some downloads and additional materials. And we don't have time to go through all of them uh, because I can only show you three of the key features today. So I really encourage you to take a look at this after the webinar and explore the other sections as well. The first thing that I want to show you today has to do with this interactive map right here. Um, what's visualized here is the overall performance of countries across all SDGs. Um, so you can see here the Nordic countries are the ones in green that are performing best on the SDG index and the countries in orange are the ones that are performing uh, not as good. What you can actually do here is to get a really good overview of where uh, European countries are facing some of the big challenges in Europe. By clicking one of these SDG buttons here, you can um, look at country performance for just that particular SDG. So let's say, for example, for SDG 13 on climate change, you'll be able to see exactly what Guillaume told us earlier. Uh, we see lots of orange and red, meaning that countries are facing significant or major challenges on climate change. Um, that's the first, the first aspect I wanted to show you, which really helps you get um, a good overview at the European perspective. The second part I want to show you today has to do with a country level perspective. So we call this a country profile. You can see here the country profile for Germany. And um, in the first section here, current assessment, you'll be able to see how Germany is doing for each of the SDGs. So you can see right away that Germany is doing better on SDGs eight and nine and struggling more on SDGs 12 and 14. We also have a trend sections trends section, which shows you how Germany is doing on the SDGs over time. The green arrow indicates that Germany is on a track to achieve the SDG by 2030, and the red arrow means that Germany is uh, actually, progress is moving in the wrong direction. So um, the country profile is a really great way to get a quick level overview of how a country is doing and what the key challenges are. And uh, we have lots of people who actually take snapshots of this page that uh, to use in reports to give their audience a quick overview of the main challenges a country is facing. Um, now, you can actually go more in depth than that. You can click on any of these goals to get more information. Um, when you click on it, this context menu on the right, on the left hand side opens. It's a little bit small, so you can use this handle to make it a little bit bigger. And you will get here um, a bar chart of country performance the best countries on the left-hand side all the way to the right. You can see that Germany is sort of in the bottom third of performance on SG14. You will have a description. And then you can actually see the indicators that make up um, Germany's performance. And you can see that Germany is not doing so well on SG14 due to their poor performance on overexploited fish stocks and fish caught by trawling. Um, you also have access to the leave no one behind index that Guillaume mentioned, as well as the spillover index. And when you click on those, you can actually see all of the indicators that make up this score. The third and last aspect of the data platform that I want to share with you today allows you to actually dive even deeper into the data. So this is useful if you really want to go to the indicator level to understand um, what's really happening at a specific indicator. If you scroll down a little bit more on the country profile, you have a section with indicators, and here you can see all 113 indicators that make up the Europe Sustainable Development Report. And you can click on any of these indicators to get, again, additional context on the left-hand side. So here we are looking at prevalence of obesity. These are the number, the percentage of people of the adult population who are obese. And again, you have a bar chart that shows you that Denmark is uh, performing best on this indicator all the way to who's performing worst. And we are also able to show you um, a trend over time. So you can see that Germany um, was at 16% obesity in 2000 and has constantly been increasing over the last 16 years. 
Um, so this is really great for diving even deeper into the data. You also have access to some of the metadata, such as a description, uh, the long-term objective, the goal, and in many cases, um, a source that you can click on and that takes you right to the actual database. Um, so I'll stop here. I know this uh, was a lot and um, the best way actually to, to understand it and get a feel for it yourself is to use it. Um, and of course, we are available for questions uh, in the upcoming Q&A session, as well as um, afterwards by email. Great. Thanks, Fen. Good segue. We do have a few questions, so I'm going to go ahead and start with some of those. Um, Guillaume, I think this one might be for you. Ian asks, will the 2020 uh, report include the UK in its coverage? And are there any plans for a UK cities index? Yeah, thank you. That's a, that's a great question. Uh, so we did include the UK last year. Um, it was a it was a tricky situation because uh, because Brexit was uh, we were in the in the middle of Brexit. So we included the UK. We debated for a long while whether we would keep the UK in the overall EU population weighted average, which we use to generate the EU country profiles. And in the end, we adopted kind of a mixed approach where we presented the results for the UK, but we did an average of the EU 27. Um, next for next edition we do we still want to include the uk we uh not in the average of the eu obviously but as a separate country profile um if data availability permits it um, and we also want to include as well some of the the efta uh the efta countries um uh, as well that's all a matter of data availability so uh so hopefully um uh, we will have enough data from European Commission services to still be able to present compar comparable um, data and indicators for the UK and other um, and other European um, uh, countries. Great, thanks. Uh, Aaron, uh, I'm on the UK City Index. UK City Index. Not that I'm aware of. Not that I'm aware of. Um, but this is something uh, we would be uh, we, we would be very interested in in, in doing in going more at the territorial um, uh, dimension of SDG implementation. But not that I'm aware of um, at the moment. No. Okay, great. I think this next question is for Finn. Uh, Erevin asks, what are the sources of data for the compilation, and do you by any chance leverage any data from satellites at all? That's a great question. Um, so there's a few different sources of data. Um, we have about two thirds of our data that comes from official statistics. So this could be the World Health Organization. Uh, for the European Sustainable Development Report, actually a lot of data comes from Eurostat. And then we have about a third of our data that comes from what we call inofficial sources. Uh, so this could be data from, from researchers or nonprofit organizations. And um, some of the data we use is based on, on satellite data. Um, so, um, for example, when it comes to, um, um, I believe, CO2 emissions, or when it comes to some of our spillover indicators, um, these are based on satellite data, but we don't do, um, we don't do our own analysis of, of satellite data in any way. So we use whatever our researchers are working with or what the official um, agencies provide. Okay, great. Thanks for uh, answering. Uh, Laura asks, um, and this might be for Guillaume Orphan, um, how can we incorporate quantitatively the indicators needed for tracking COVID-19 if they are not included among the indicators of the Agenda 2030? Yeah, this is a this is a great um, this is a great question. Um, I mean, I think if you look at SDG 3.D, um, and I don't have it right in front of me, but I believe it speaks about um, countries' uh, resilience, uh, you know, prevention and preparedness for uh, for facing uh, for for dealing with global health security. So in theory, it is at least uh, partly covered within SDG 3.D, but the the reality is that up until now, the focus, let's say globally or even for Europe, and this. It's the case for the SDGs. It's the case for the work of a lot of organizations. The focus was not so much on um, how to manage pandemics um, and on global health security. I mean, we were speaking a lot. A lot of organizations were speaking about the the need to 
strengthen primary healthcare system, ambulatory care, um, and uh, and on the efficiency of health systems, a, a little bit less on the, the question of, uh, of resilience and, and preparedness. Um, but I think there is, it, within the SDGs, it is at least partly covered. Now, what kind of measure do we have at the global level um, to kind of aggregate and summarize countries' preparedness to face uh, pandemics? The main one we have, which combines several um, dimensions, is this Global Health Security Index that was published a few months actually before COVID. So the timing is, is, is amazing because it was published in November 2019, led by the John Hopkins University. And actually, the framework is, 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 is very relevant in the current crisis because it does track you know, um, countries' ability to deal with zoonotic diseases, um, the, health, the hospital um, care system uh, capacity, um, the capacity to do tests and reporting. So it does capture all the, the right dimensions. But when we compare these results with the US, UK, and a few other uh, countries that top this index to actually what happened during COVID-19, it seems that um, that uh, that the results are sometimes actually the opposite from what we we see in in, in reality, and so that's why I think with COVID nineteen we we might want to rethink a little bit more about these uh, these indicators. But another reason is that uh, the global health security index cannot anticipate um, political actions, right? And a lot of the the, the response to an epidemic is also related to. Um, to how quickly and, deci and decisive um, uh, politicians are able to be in order to, to respond to, um, to these kinds of pandemics. And this is outside of the scope of the, the global health security. So, uh, so we have done some early analysis on this. Uh, we have published this on our website. This is available and I'm happy to share also the link, um, the link to this. Um, but I think this will really be a question as countries will start picking up the, the pieces and as we will start thinking about what, what more in terms of data and monitoring systems do we need, um, rethinking a little bit uh, the, the the measures around global health um, security and countries preparedness will be will be a key a key issue. Great, yeah, lots to think about, lots of uh, lots of issues around COVID nineteen that no one expected, and it'll be interesting to see how all that data fits together uh, in next November. I think those are all of our questions now for the first Q and A. Um, so I think we're going to turn to our colleagues at IEEP, Guillaume and Fen. You're welcome to turn off your, your cameras and microphones. Great. I'm now happy to welcome Svetlina Filipova and Eloise Bowden, both from IEEP, as our next speakers. Let me make you the presenter, Svetlina. Okay. And Very much, Ian. Able... All looks great. I... It's almost coming. Yes, we can see your slides, so you're good to go. Right. Excellent. Um, hello, everyone. I'm pleased to welcome you from my office kitchen on behalf of the Institute for European Environmental Policy, which is a think tank existing for more than 20 years, uh, 40 years, providing policy support uh, to the European Commission and the uh, European Union bodies. Um, I will be, um, uh, my name is Cetalina Filippo, and I'm heading the uh, Environmental Governance and Sustainable Development um, stream of work in the organization. And I'm going to share this presentation with my colleague, uh, Elvis Boden. Um, I'm um, I'm um, going to uh, briefly speak about uh, the um, um, European Green Deal and um, the uh, efforts on sustainability mainstreaming, and then um, um, provide concrete examples of ongoing processes in streamlining SDGs in uh, some of the um, uh, European Union uh, frameworks, which is in this case the better regulation. Um, further, my colleague will speak about uh, mainstreaming SDGs and the response to the COVID-19 uh, recovery plan. And then further, we'll give examples of recent um, achievements in, in terms of SDGs integration uh, in some of the economic uh, policy frameworks um, uh, in, uh, in the European Union level, uh, namely the European semester. Since some 25% of our um, participants are, are coming from out of the EU, I'll allow myself a very brief um, background and the situation point um the green deal the green deal is uh, the new uh, growth 
um, strategy of the European Union. Previously, it was um, uh, preceded by the European 2020 strategy, which had as main priority smart, sustainable and inclusive growth. Um, within the, this context, uh, the Commission was um, um, striving to um, progress in terms of uh, implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals and has um, launched a um, um, concrete effort in terms of policy and legal development. But also there was one reflection paper which discussed what are the possible alternative uh, ways the Commission and the European Union can approach um, the uh, mainstreaming of SDGs. And uh, out of the options, uh, unfortunately, it was not decided to have a, a one overarching um, European Union um, st strategy on SDGs, but rather an approach of uh, alignment and mainstreaming. And the current commission within the Green Deal, um, it has uh, in, uh, included as an integral part uh, the strategy to implement the United Nations 2030 Agenda and the Sustainable Development Goals. And indeed uh, strives and um, com um, commits to put sustainability and the well-being of citizens at the centre of economic policy. Uh, indeed, in the um, uh, COVID-19 reality, it's becoming even more prominent that uh, concerted effort is uh, placed on um, um, ensuring sustainability, well-being and the uh, citizens' health. So, um, um, the, the Sustainable Development Goals, um, we hope to be a framework uh, which would lead uh, the um, um, hopefully green recovery measures uh, towards a sustainability, a sustainable investment and sustainable pathways. Um, what the Green Deal um, is um, uh, pledging, I would just stop on a few elements uh, which are of relevance, is that all the EU strategies and processes should be designed in a way to achieve the European Green Deal and mainstream SDGs. Um, there are discussions now on introducing of sustainability proving, proofing in order to screen uh, the impact uh, on the climate, environment and social objectives. My colleague will speak more on the economic elements, so I'm not going to touch uh, th those in my presentation. But uh, now the narrative uh, about fair transition and uh, EU resilience is becoming more and more important. And, um, um, and Guillaume has mentioned early on, uh, responding to your questions, that um, Indeed, the EU will be looking a lot more carefully into three elements, um, health, well-being and resilience. And we know um, which goals are um, um, including those elements now, and they, in a way, would be becoming uh, more and more horizontal, similar, I would say, to um, the, one, the 16 and 17 goals, which are rather cross-cutting and uh, are spreading out through uh, a lot, uh, I mean, all of the other goals. So it looks like the, um, the, the discussion will be going in this direction. And we're very much uh, happy uh, in, I mean, that uh, this might be a, a way to um, in, in, increase the importance of sustainability mainstreaming. And um, unfortunately, we're losing a um, negative um, uh, event but it might, to my end, have a beneficial impact in terms of raising the profile. Um, then, uh, um, Guillaume also mentioned that um, it's of utmost importance that we uh, challenge uh, um, the uh, status quo and we check and monitor progress uh, throughout regularly in terms of uh, achieving uh, the uh, goals. And deferring from the Eurostat report, for instance, I think one of the uh, strengths of the European Independent um, SDG report um, is that uh, it measures distance to targets and provides a lot of uh, clarity in terms of um, um, what, uh, what remains to be achieved in a way. Then, uh, returning back, back to the frame of the European Green Deal, it relies a lot uh, on uh, digital transformation and digital technologies 
uh, in attaining sustainable development goals. So in my further talk, I just here want to share a few um, reflections on the European, um, uh, green, uh, I mean, European SDG report without at all claiming of being uh, any, uh, any more de uh, detailed. Uh, but um, acknowledging that the report it does provide really good statistic overview over the last five years of um, um, the development in terms of <coughs> achieving the SDGs, still it, it, there is room for improvement. Some indicators uh, sometimes offer impartial information. And I'll give you just one example in terms of um, one of the indicators. Uh, there is a, this indicator on grassland uh, butterflies index, which is um, uh, informative on the population of um, uh, pollinators and their status. And um, currently the report includes information on this index only from 12 member states. So. Um, this is just one of the mm, examples where information is uh, incomplete uh, and partial. Further, um, um, there is um, a common opinion of the policy um, community that um, um, some of the indicators are still not sufficiently adequate and um, um, they don't uh, really uh, reflect uh, well the uh, European conditions and need to be uh, adapted further to be um, more indicative. And these kind of um, thoughts come in again in the context of the overall rethinking of um, European Union approach to sustainability and the mainstreaming of SDGs. So probably this is again a good moment to proceed in this uh, regard. Um, Another element I wanted to mention, indeed, um, uh, about 37, like exactly 37 indicators are the so-called multi-purpose indicators. They are used to monitor more than one goals. But um, in this context, uh, we should always account at the complexity of the SDGs and the interlinked nature of the different uh, goals. And um, further work needs to be um, focused on investigating the synergies, the trade-offs, and the unintended consequences. And later on, I'll discuss uh, some uh, ideas how this can be um, approached. And uh, just to bring your attention and call uh, you uh, to check the um, European Environment, State and Outlook report, which was recently um, <clears throat> published. It really provides additional relevant data, which is um, alarming us on the um, urgency uh, of um, um, change of um, approach uh, towards uh, sustainability. Then I wanted to talk with you about one framework, the Better Regulation Guidelines and Toolbox. Better regulation is a, um, um, a set of uh, key principles which are guiding the European Commission in their um, assessment of all initiatives, uh, proposals and legislative assessments of uh, uh, existing legislation. It is assumed that um, better regulation as an instrument can become one of those coherent frameworks uh, through which uh, SDGs can be uh, more consistently addressed in the uh, policy making process of the European Union. The Better Regulation Guidelines has been designed to include assessment of uh, all the three elements, economic, social and environmental impact, but there is a lot uh, more one can do in terms of integration. Um, a systematic assessment of the methodological options for further integration of the SDGs in better regulation is definitely needed, but uh, I'll share with you some uh, quick um, uh, recommendations, which some of uh, which can be already taken into account in uh, uh, the process. Currently, the European Commission is reviewing the better regulation uh, from the perspective of mainstreaming of the SDGs, and a com uh, communication is expected to be launched uh, by the end of May. So it's very much now the right timing for this discussion and uh, to, to make sure that um, um, 
concerns in terms of uh, current uh, bet regulation and the possible uh, ways of its improvement are, are shared. Um, as I mentioned, the bet regulation includes a, a set of um, 65, I think, tools which are practical guidances on the, how uh, the principles of better regulation can be um, implemented in um, the, the process and includes issues like how uh, one can assess impact, how one should uh, perform a um, um, impact assessment or a um, um, fitness check, ex post evaluation, and then how one can uh, run a uh, stakeholder involvement campaign, so uh, um, consultation. So this, these are um, all different tools which are um, leading the Commission in their work of ensuring um, better regulation uh, and consistent um, compliance with these, the principles in the better regulation in all their policy initiatives and legislative developments. What I wanted to mention that um, um, the better regulation is um, a bit um, uh, lacking uh, a consistent assessment of a long-lasting impact um, can be improved in terms of measurement of dis distance to targets. Um, a, um, uh, as I also noted, he, for the sake of the better regulation, is one of the instruments that the European Commission is working on Again, a horizontal review of how impact on health and well-being and uh, uh, resilience and response to crisis can be integrated in all the policy areas. Then, um, cost-benefit is still um, a cost-benefit analysis still in the core of the assessment, and um, we are very much um, um, encouraging a combination in the introduction of more qualitative elements which will be also linked to quality of life, well-being and health. And we have already good examples of the European semester um, and SDG mainstreaming and my colleague is going to touch upon those. As I mentioned, there are these three silos, uh, economic, social, environmental impact, and uh, the pet regulation does not have a mechanism yet to uh, ensure that the co-benefits of um, uh, between uh, uh, the economic and social, for instance, and environmental um, impact uh, are taken into account, nor the trade-offs. And what is really important here to, to be um, um, further analyzed is in case of trade-offs, how uh, one should prioritize, what criteria uh, are to be used to prioritize one or another uh, measure. And I'll give you a simple example. Uh, the um, economic uh, um, and social um, uh, streams of assessment would be um, very much in favour of creating green jobs, but then the environmental concerns might come from the perspective of um, developing uh, those green jobs in the environmental, in the biodiversity vulnerable habitats, and uh, there will be immediately a uh, trade-off that needs to be considered. Um, I can, and I, as I said, uh, further work in uh, designing and adapting the indicators is something that uh, we are very much hoping that uh, we'll be able to engage in along uh, our work uh, together with SDSN on the next iteration of the European SDG report. Um, and as I said, um, indeed, a thorough methodological review is needed in order to mainstream ASDGs in the uh, European uh, policy contexts and the um, number of strategic, uh, strategic documents and policies which are being now or recently were um, published. And um, I'll leave that to a later stage, but for the sake of a, um, a start in terms of thinking on the SDG, we're thinking that um, one can develop a basic scoreboard, uh, and a kind of a, a quick analysis indicating um, uh, to what extent uh, the SDGs um, will be impacted by certain uh, initiative or policy. And um, th this kind of uh, scoreboard uh, would be a quick way also to visualize um, the uh, potential impact and um, 
um, you might know that uh, each uh, proposal um, from the Commission is, uh, is subject uh, to um, stakeholder consultation from the beginning of its inception and, uh, and we, this is called the roadmap uh, consultation where the Commission is sharing um, uh, the content and the, the objectives of um, a future policy that is being developed and is, uh, this is the time when the stakeholders are invited to provide their first input. Um, we were thinking that uh, if we share, for instance, together with the roadmap, uh, the basic scoreboard, which assess to what extent the relevant um, um, SDGs will be affected, this will be very important uh, to get first feedback from stakeholders, but also to decide on a degree of relevance and then design a proportionate um, um, uh, analysis and uh, uh, invest in the scoping exercise, which is actually the uh, definition of impact, and then have better outcome uh, from the uh, impact assessment phase. Again, I'll call um, on um, uh, further the further need of translating the um, SDG goals uh, for the European context. Uh, and this is very important for the exercise of um, uh, mainstreaming of SDGs in all the other policies. One needs to have a clear guidance. Okay, I think that um, um, another horizontal element which is very important to be taken into account in terms of sustainability is the rights of future generation and the potential burden that we might be transferring to the uh, further generation on the decisions and policy choices we are making today. So we're hoping that um, the um, uh, upcoming uh, reviews will take into account also the intergenerational equity. I'll stop here and transfer um, uh, the, um, the talk to my colleague Eloise, uh, who, who is going to uh, talk to you about um, uh, oh, what did I do? I went backwards. Wait, wait, wait. Yes. Oh, uh, just a few, few uh, notes on the stakeholder engagement. Uh, there was a EU high level multi stakeholder platform on SDGs, which mandate expired. And it's not yet clear what will be the next forum uh, at EU level, which will be coordinating uh, uh, SDGs uh, um, integration. But um, there, there were a lot of voices on um, the probably not clear mandate and uh, not uh, efficient enough outcomes of this multi-stakeholder platform. So it might be a completely different um, setup. But what is important is that um, a, a structured consultation with uh, uh, stakeholders is uh, included in all the um, uh, ongoing um, uh, reviews. The better regulation is having, as I mentioned, a um, stakeholder consultation uh, um, process. But what it was identified as missing is actually a structured consultation with uh, the scientific um, community. And the complexity of um, uh, SDGs and their um, inter interrelation uh, would be definitely posing difficulties. Therefore, we're thinking of suggesting a multidisciplinary advisory um, body, whatever we call it, committee, uh, which would be composed of scientific experts in civil society and will be uh, um, having different members depending on the um, uh, subject matters that are uh, going to be uh, discussed, I mean, the expertise required. But still, uh, this would address a few concerns presently voiced by uh, civil society and, and by uh, um, policy uh, uh, community, is that um, there should be more uh, scientific evidence for better policy making and in more independent scientific input. Um, this would assist the assessment of um, expected various impact in their complexity, as I mentioned, and uh, will help the, to depart from the uh, commission-led and own process. It, now the better regulation is very much perceived as a commission-led uh, process. Um, and then it might help also in terms of um, strengthening the impartiality of, uh, of this um, 
process and um, improve accountability. One element I wanted to mention only on um, the stakeholder consultation. Although the process is quite clear and well structured, there is one element that um, is raising concerns, which is the lack of clarity of how input is actually considered in the policy making process. I will stop here as I promised and I'll give the floor to my colleague Eloise. Thank you. Thank I'll um, turn the slides uh, upon your instruction. Yes, thank you. Um, so now I will talk a bit more about the economic uh, elements very quickly. Um, can you change slides, Vitalina, please? Um, okay. Uh, so the the European Commission, ah, no, the European Commission is about uh, to to publish a new budget uh, adapted to the pandemic on the 6th of May, and Ursula von der Leyen mentioned uh, two trillion euros worth of investments. So that's why we have to be careful uh, on the nature of those uh, investments, and for that we can build on the lessons from the 2008 economic crisis. Uh, in 2008, the EU green investments reached nearly 60% of the stimulus uh, spending. However, uh, most of the green measures failed to achieve a systemic and lasting changes, and most countries were left after the crisis with environmentally and socially harmful subsidies uh, and inadequate regulatory regimes. So, What's needed uh, for the forthcoming recovery plans is that they're designed to support a systemic change that is aligned with the SDGs. Uh, they must cover all the key systems, energy, mobility, nutrition, housing, and leisure. Uh, and we need to achieve a right balance between compensating the businesses and industries, but also having a structural reorientation measures. The recovery uh, plans should also address uh, major system lock-ins, for instance, dominant design or infrastructures, uh, and they need to strengthen uh, economic, social, societal resilience to cope with the multiple shocks, uh, for instance, uh, climate change. Uh, and finally, we need to have innovation for transformative change policies. Uh, that means that we need to ensure that Horizon Europe, but also the national uh, research and investment fundings are secured and that they're uh, reoriented towards uh, system innovations that promote transformation pathways and allows uh, for experimentations. Then secondly, on state aid, under EU treaty, state aid is usually uh, not permitted except under certain rules. Um, but with this new economic crisis, the European Commission is approving state aid. So right now, more than ever, we need to ensure that uh, the rules of state aid are aligned uh, to SDGs and that they're not counterproductive. Uh, next slide, please. So with uh, some other think tanks, uh, with IEP, we came up with a five criteria for sustainability tests. And I'll go uh, very quickly through the criteria to ensure that the recovery plan is sustainable. Uh, the plan must be scientific, uh, must be scientific based, uh, needs to take into account resilience, uh, needs to look at equity and solidarity, always prioritize a prioritize support for vulnerable households, communities, regions, and countries. It needs to call for uh, transformative changes, like I said before. So we need to depart from carbon intensive sectors towards new sustainable practices. And finally, there needs to be scale. So the, the fiscal stimulus uh, package needs to be consequent, which is gonna be the case probably. Uh, next slide, please. Now, if we look at the economic tools that we have, uh, policymakers are facing dilemmas in the targets that they have. Um, if we look at it in terms of SDGs, we have three blocks uh, uh, that are causing dilemmas. SDG 1, which is fighting poverty. SDG 8 and 9, which is uh, economic growth, industry, and infrastructure. And the SDG 12, 13, 15, and 16, which are about climate change, biodiversity loss, 
and those three blocks uh, are creating dilemmas for policymakers because they don't have the same needs. So we need uh, we need to find the right tool, but there's no tools right now to help in the decision making. However, this pandemic is forcing us uh, to, to, to look at those dilemmas and we think that the European semester uh, which is the framework for the coordination of economic uh, policies across the EU. We think that this uh, process could be a key instrument to operationalize the SDGs and implement the European Green Deal because it's uh, the main holistic tool that we have available. Under the new European Commission and this year for the first time, because of the promise of the President of the Commission, the European semester now aims at putting SDGs at the heart of its policy making. Uh, so for the first time, there was an annex this year with the country recommendation uh, assessing the performance of member states uh, towards SDGs. And next slide, please. So we think that we could go further and with this pandemic, uh, the European semester should be uh, assessing the quality of the recovery plans uh, and adopting new approach for its recommendations uh, and support the structural reforms. So we think that uh, should also look at other shocks, not only the economic ones, and make recommendations, for instance, on the uh, adequacy of just transition plans or climate adaptation uh, plans. We also think that the semester should address systemic risk beyond the strictly economic and financial sphere, so go beyond um, deficit rules and GDP rules, uh, but look at a broader range. Um, we think that we should improve the sustainability scoreboard over time with new indicators, for instance, public funding for just transition. And finally, to have long-term planning and thinking, uh, the European semester could be complemented with what we would call a 2050 strategy for sustainable prosperity, which would have uh, long-term economic indicators. Uh, but we also recommend having indicators of well-being, sustainability, intergenerational equity, uh, upon which progress from member states would be assessed, and that would be mainstreaming SDGs uh, in the uh, EU economic tools. There, thank you very much, um, and that's that's it for our presentation. All right, thank you so much, Eloise. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time, um, but we have taken down all of your questions um, and we're gonna send them to our speakers and we will post the answers in our write-up um, afterwards. So I just want to give a, a big thank you to all of our speakers, um, both at SDSN and IEEP. Um, we will have this webinar recording available on the SDSN YouTube channel. Um, and I encourage everyone to subscribe to the SDSN newsletter or follow us or IEEP on Twitter um, for updates on the next report as well as the next consultation. Um, our next webinar in the Tracking National Progress series will be next month and we'll look at the Arab region SDG index and dashboards. Um, so we hope to see you there in that one in a month. Um, but that's it for today. So have a great rest of your day and stay safe.